Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Peter Suderman, senior editor at Reason Magazine and Reason.com. Let's start with the, make the first question really broad and just ask, what is Obamacare? Well, uh, it's a piece of legislation signed into law in March of 2010, a really lengthy piece of legislation that almost no one read before it was actually voted into law. Uh, that Nancy Pelosi famously said, we have to pass it to find out what was in it, perhaps the truest and most deliciously ironic statement in American politics in the last <laughs> decade or so. Um, it's also a kind of a, a concept um, and uh, for, a lot of the, for a lot of supporters in particular, it's an idea of a government guaranteed near universal coverage. Um, and so, I, you know, I think a lot of the tension that we've seen and a lot of sort of the debates um, and a lot of the legal wrangling that we've seen uh, in the law, you know, uh, surrounding the law has come out of the tension between the fact that it's a very specific lengthy, detailed piece of legislation and it's also uh, – uh, it's also just a sort of conceptual um, – it, it's a concept that people rally around or in some cases I, I should also you know, say that, that, that critics and opponents um, treat it that way, not, not so much as a piece of legislation where they're, they're opposed to this subsection and on this page but in fact sort of it's a, a rallying cry and a concept for, for opponents as well and so that – uh, you know, sort of that dynamic between the two really explains or helps explain a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the hoopla surrounding the law. Many people, when the law was passed, it seemed it was unclear what it actually did. There was, a, you know, did, do I just have health care now? And it may still be unclear, although people are slowly learning. But in general, what is the idea behind how the law is supposed to work? If you want to talk about the idea of the people who passed it, the people who were most responsible for designing it, the people who were uh, voting on it, folks in government basically and the people who worked directly with uh, the folks in government. Um, their idea was we want to do a – we want to pass a bill that gets us uh, as close to universal health coverage as we can get. That was their big goal. Um, they wanted it – some of them, I should say, not all of them, but some of them were also uh, quite focused on healthcare cost control. That was a big impetus. Um, we can talk about a little more later about whether or not uh, that was a good idea or, or, or a workable idea. But there were – there was a, a faction who really believed that this was a, at least a stepping stone toward um, greater healthcare cost control. But the, the big push was, uh, was the kind of liberal uh, democratic – uh, hope for universal coverage that has been going on um, really since you know World War II, uh, and kind of specifically, I would say that this is um, a, a a very you know sort of far out generation, uh, an iteration in some ways of the effort that started with Ted Kennedy back in the seventies and his failed universal health care legislation, which then sort of evolved eventually into the Clinton health care legislation, which also didn't fail in the early 90s and then um, and then came back up and sort of, you know, we saw another swell, another wave uh, come through on the uh, – within the Democratic Party uh, starting around 2007, which – when a bunch of them really decided we're – we now have the opportunity to do a universal health care bill and maybe even get it passed. Um, and so that's what this is – most, I would say, and that was the goal: was get as many people covered as you can reasonably. Um, How does it purport to do that? The way, it, the basic way it does that um, is the concept that became known as the three-legged stool, borrowed from the Massachusetts plan signed into law by Mitt Romney, um, which is uh, you know regulate, subsidize, and mandate. And so you have a series of. Uh, regulations on the health insurance industry. In particular, you have guaranteed issue and community rating, which basically say that uh, insurers have to sell to everyone and they can't um, – they are restricted in terms of how they can price in based on your individual health history. 
Um, so that means that you that you have cancer, they have to sell to you, and they can't charge you more. Right. So pre the pre-existing conditions regulations, and so the pre-existing condition stuff, it's not completely taken out. There's smoking still allowed. There's still some uh, age rating is still allowed, but it's been restricted and compressed. Most pre-existing conditions um, can't be factored into your individual price. Instead, they rate. Uh, it's community rating, right? They rate the community and the sort of community health as a whole, and then you're paying uh, a part of it. What do we mean by community? Is this like your th at the state level? Is this is the United depends. States it one whole? Community? It just depends on the plan, um, and sort of it's there are some, but the the the, the major thing is uh, the the important thing sort of for the for the way this works for both for individuals and policy wise is that they are not judging uh, individuals based on their their individual health history. So your history of cancer is the sort of the, the, the big obvious one. But whatever your health history, your expensive health treatments, um, they, can't, uh, they can't price based on that. Um, and then, of course, these regulations uh, drive up the cost. Yeah, that sounds insurance. really expensive. If you can't charge more for cancer, it sounds really expensive. Uh, it, it's complicated, but it does – I mean regulations uh, – the regulations overall in the law drive up the cost of health insurance. So there's subsidies. Um, and those subsidies are, in some ways, also serve the the purpose of off of. How should I say this? Uh, in some ways, they resemble. You could argue that they resemble an individual market version of the tax carve out we currently have for employer health insurance, and so that. Which is, explain? Can you explain is, that actually? So, uh, employer health insurance is tax advantaged, which means um, basically that if. Your employer could give you a check and you could buy your own insurance. You'd be paying for that with post-tax dollars, with dollars that uh, the federal government has taken its cut out of. Or your employer can buy health insurance for you and that money doesn't get taxed along the way. It's part of your benefits package or anything. Right. Yeah. Which means that, uh, you're, that there is more value for employers to give you health insurance than there is to give you cash, which means we have an employer-sponsored system. Uh, that has led to all sorts of complications within the market, um, but also to, uh, in many cases, extremely uh, robust gold-plated health plans being given because those health insurance dollars are more value, relatively speaking. And so at the margins, you end up with bigger benefits than you would if you just paid people cash and everyone sort of got uh, and and all and the money you know was and the money was not tax advantaged, depending on the how you purchased your health insurance. This is slightly off topic from Obamacare, but it's a – I mean that the employer – the tie between employers and health insurance is ubiquitous but also very weird. Like we don't you know, we, it's, it's, we're used to it, but it's not – it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense on its face and it certainly isn't the way we get anything else. Cato provides me with health insurance, but it doesn't provide me with auto insurance or it doesn't pay for my grocery bills, things like that. Um, so I wonder if you could quickly tell us how we got to that. It's an outgrowth of uh, World War II era price, um, wage and price controls in which employers were restricted in terms of how they could pay people um, and – but they were not restricted in terms of the benefits that they could provide. So employers, of course, being limited in terms of the way they could compete for better employees um, uh, through through cash, they started piling on benefits. And, um, and so what you have then is uh, the system that has grown up in the United States, uh, relatively unique, not entirely, but relatively unique, um, in which most people get their health insurance through their employer because there's a tax advantage, um, because employers sort of have long been incentivized to offer this. Um, and that didn't cause huge problems for many, many decades. Um, you could argue that it was a problem, but it wasn't. But people weren't feeling the problem immediately because, uh, for decades after World War II, um, for several decades, it was pretty common to have one or two jobs in your life, and so you would uh, you'd get into the workforce and you'd stay at the same job for twenty or thirty or forty years, and so you'd stay with the same health insurer for twenty or thirty or forty years, and and that worked okay for a lot of people. And in fact, it still works reasonably well for a lot of people. It's a highly imperfect system um, and there's – there are a lot of problems with it. But um, a lot of people do all right in terms of their health insurance or at least I should say a lot of people are satisfied with it. Um, but there are long-term problems as the economy is, is changing um, and as it becomes less common 
to keep a job for 10 or 20 or 30 years. Well, that, that became a thing when we were talking about the law and running up to passing it. The idea of the 40 million uninsured or something or along those lines uh, were – I mean in between jobs, employment would therefore create a problem with insurance and that would – that makes it very strange. And so the law was partially passed to solve that problem. Uh, and so you mentioned the two parts of the, of the three-legged stool. We had the subsidies and then we had price controls and uh, guaranteed issue community rating. But then there's this other one which is the individual mandate. Right. Right? But what is that? How did that work? How does that fit into the stool? Here? So if you have um, subsidized health insurance that is uh, regulated in such a way that you – that people can't – that excuse me, that insurers – um, cannot, can't discriminate based on pre-existing conditions and have to sell it to you, community rating guaranteed issue, then that creates a, an opportunity at least and arguably an incentive for uh, free writing on that system for uh, in the classic example, you know, calling your a, a health insurance a health insurance company on the way to the emergency room and buying coverage um, for the very expensive you know, right before you're about to get and an expensive and seat procedure no. and then canceling it as soon as the procedure is over so you pay your one month's premium and maybe a deductible and um, save yourself tens of thousands of dollars that way. And so the individual mandate, uh, which is the requirement that virtually all Americans be covered um, either buying into the system or being covered by Medicare, Medicaid, you know, one of the uh, – some other component. But the requirement that virtually all Americans maintain – um, coverage and not just any coverage but coverage that meets certain minimum essential health uh, benefits that sort of has enough – all of the stuff that government says this is what coverage is. Um, and so that, that is meant that, to draw people into the system and prevent free riding. And that qualification of what minimal essential coverage is as defined by the government – is very important because I mean you can't have a very bare bones plan, correct? Or is that doesn't really work with the system? Bare bones plans certainly exist. One can have them. Many people did have them. Fewer people uh, now have them as a result of Obamacare. Uh, the that is one of the major effects and one of the ways that all of these people that when you heard about people losing their health insurance plans in many cases, not all, but in many, it was because their plans didn't meet the minimum requirements under the law. Um, and so, yeah. What I mean, so what, what Obamacare does in a lot of ways is it turns health insurance into a kind of public utility um, because everyone is more or less everyone is required to purchase health insurance. The government decides what health insurance is and should be. Um, it sets out uh, in, in addition to sort of setting minimums, it also sets out tiers of coverage. There's silver coverage and gold coverage and um, uh, within the exchanges and then it sets up um, these exchanges, these health insurance exchanges uh, which uh, which sell the plans and are sort of and are, and are built and managed by uh, by the government that way. So what you have is our government designed plans sold in a government run store. Um, and – That you have uh, to shop at or, or in some way you have to shop at. That you are required to shop at or pay a penalty. It is possible to opt out and but you're – but if you do, you're – you are supposed to in most cases uh, pay a penalty. Although uh, there is some indication from the Obama administration that as penalty time comes up this year, there are going to be relatively lenient, perhaps extremely lenient in terms of assessing the penalty and in terms of um, giving people ways, additional ways to opt out. Um, if you look at uh, – if you look at the the categories of allowable opt out, basically so the reasons that you're allowed to use, um, I'm going to – I don't recall the exact language and I don't have it in front of me. But there's a bunch of different reasons why you might not have to pay the penalty and the final one is basically a kind of catch-all other category. It's something like, uh, you know, additional – Circumstances, mm -hmm. right? It's just it's just sort of some sort of um, it's basically a, if we decide that you that you need an opt out, um, and uh, and so there's there's this weird thing where there's a mandate. It's real. Um, it exists. It's part of the law, and yet it's also 
sort of it's it's it is in some way theoretical, um, and people will pay it. People will definitely pay the man, uh, pay the mandate penalty. Um, it's not that every single person will get an opt out, but the law is created in such a way where it's not even where where there's not an awful lot of clarity about how it you know how and when and where it works um, and and how it's going to work. The story that you've given us of how this law works, this this three-legged stool, seems, I mean, as you've described it, fairly straightforward. The, each of the three pieces conceptually makes sense. How they fit together makes sense. Why each is necessary for the others to work makes sense. But that seems to cut against the, say, the Pelosi's comment that you mentioned earlier: if we have to pass the law to figure out what's in it, which describes, which would seem to describe a very complicated law that's too difficult for us to understand before we can pass it. So what's what's more complicated than this simple three-legged stool? Well, uh, even implementing the three-legged stool is itself pretty complicated. You have to – for the subsidies, for example, you have to decide exactly who gets subsidies, um, exactly how the subsidy amount is calculated. Uh, you have to set up a management system, just an administrative system that can dole out this money um, or figure out if uh, – you know, and figure out who gets it under what circumstances, how much um, in addition to the decisions that, that have to be made. For the regulations, like I said, we, there's um, guaranteed issue and community rating and there are restrictions on insurers. But they, the, um, the people who wrote the law and the the, the folks in Congress who were sort of put together the legislation spent months debating exactly what kinds of restrictions and exactly how uh, how those restric- restrictions should be applied. And b- by debating, I suppose I should really say negotiating with insurers, because a lot of this was negotiated with the industry. And so it's it's relatively simple to grasp those three basic components. But then even under them, there are a huge number of very tiny, very finicky decisions uh, to be made and then an even larger number of steps to be taken to implement and administrate all of these particulars um, uh, you know, across the entire United States, especially since um, a fair amount of it is – uh, is at least managed, maybe not not decided, but managed at the state level, um, especially in the states that chose to establish their own exchanges. Um, they don't have a huge amount of autonomy. They do have a fair amount of responsibility. Uh, and so they have to do a lot. But then in addition to um, these, the, the, the big sort of, the, the three-legged stool, the big headline components, there are many, many other parts of the law. There are... Um, the snooky tax. Uh, right. right. So there's tanning, tanning beds, tax, the right? Tax, yes. there's, there are all of these revenue raisers that are built into the law um, because in order to fund all of these subsidies and the expansion of Medicaid that goes along with it, that was uh, initially calculated to be just shy of, of a trillion dollars virtually... Uh, Total cost of the law. Virtually all of that is subsidies, it's the, uh, or subsidies are Medicaid, I should say. Um, and uh, so you have to come up with some way to to pay for that. Um, and so they, there's a bunch of revenue raisers. There were a bunch of alterations to Medicare, future Medicare spending, uh, that cutbacks, um, uh, sort of cutbacks, uh, reductions um, in planned spending that uh, that were going to be used to move money over. Uh, to to subsidy spending, and so those are complicated, right? As soon as anytime you get into tax law, it's very complicated. There's individual taxes, there's corporate taxes, there's uh, it's it's a it's a big um, you know it's a big spaghetti ball, uh, and then you have things you have additional regulations on the insurers, things like the medical loss ratio rule, which uh, limits how much um, uh, insurers, which says that insurers basically have to spend eighty or eighty five percent. Of their uh, of premium dollars on um, on health care on health and well, well then what counts as a health care expense as opposed to administrative expenses right so eighty five Administ- right other Anything expenses else might that be go to profit patients. or marketing or overhead um, so do you know does the do, does buying a new computer um, count as a healthcare expense? You know, for the for the staffer who's maintaining the spreadsheets uh, that you know where all of your plan information. You know, it, 
No, in most cases. Um, sounds like a nightmare. What about you know, what about um, paying for quality improvements that are not actual health care but are just sort of business rearrangements that might provide more efficient care to people? Well, do, do, those, do they count? All these decisions have to be made. And so then in, a, in addition to this law, which was more than 2,000 pages, we've spawned thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of proposed regulations and final regulations and final final regulations and then the actual final regulations. <laughs> um, and then those regulations each time they're released spawn thousands of pages of comments and suggestions. And, you know. and so it's, it's incredibly complex and no one knows – how the whole thing works in every detail. There is no person, I feel comfortable saying that, who can simply explain every single de- – there, there are many people who understand the law very well and are, are, are legitimate experts with great expertise. But there's no one who understands every single part of it perfectly. So let me see if I got this straight because I, I think there's another part here which is important to point out, which is – so you make the insurers – going back to the general overview, idea of how it's supposed to work. You make the insurers uh, cover and charge no more, cost them a ton of money and it seems like the individual mandate then is needed to basically funnel money into the insurance companies, uh, which is – which means that the individual mandate has to apply to mostly healthy people because if it was mostly sick people who didn't have health insurance, then you would just have sick people in your health insurance pool and that would be a problem. So you need – you really need younger people to subsidize older people. So it kind of works in this strange cross-subsidy way, right? It's a redistributionist law ultimately speaking and I don't think a lot of people realize that. The insurers were pressed heavily to support the law and uh, – Ultimately, they did publicly su- um, support it, uh, or, or at least you know they uh, uh, they were they were relatively favorable to it, um, and they have continued to to be relatively to maintain a public stance of relative favorability to the law. But their whole um, their their price for this was we absolutely will not do that without. The individual mandate. They said the individual mandate had to be there. Um, they have wanted to strengthen the mandate, made the, make the penalty uh, tougher, um, make the requirement have fewer holes in it, um, fewer grandfathered clauses, fewer all that stuff. Yeah. They so I mean they the the insurance industry saw pre existing uh, conditions regulations go into effect without individual man without an individual mandate in a number of states over the 15 or 20 years before Obamacare passed. And what happened in every one of those markets was what uh, we call a death spiral, which is that um, the uh, sick people beca- uh, bought, into the, bought into the plans and therefore because the, the health plans were relatively uh, sicker overall, the price went up. Well, as soon as the price goes up, as you know the, the most the most basic uh, of economics thinking will tell us uh, tell us that a small number of people will no longer consider that a good value, and most li- likely it's going to be this, the healthiest people, and so they leave the plan. And so when that happens, the plan gets a little less healthy, a little sicker overall, and the price goes up once again. And this happens over and over again, and over and over again until you have an extremely small, extremely sick population paying an awful lot of money, and that's what happened in every single state where. Uh, where pre-existing conditions, regulations were passed without a mandate. Um, and typically you'd see the individual market drop from about 5 percent of the state's market to less than 0.5 percent of the state's market. And this would happen in just a couple of years. It happened in New York, happened in Washington State, um, a couple other places. And uh, it was really dramatic. The insurance industry did not want to repeat that. And so they said, uh, look, whatever you do, we'll, we will get on board with this publicly at least for the most part, we certainly won't really stand in your way, won't really try and stop you so long as there is a robust enough mandate that that, that, that won't happen again. And so um, – and that's you know, another component here, another part of the story just overall is how much of this law was negotiated with industry – with healthcare industry groups and how much – in some ways, you know, it was sort of interesting seeing – 
um, the administration in the fall of 2009 when it was getting – when you know the, the Obamacare passage effort was really ramping up and they started to really push back against insurers and dis, you know, decided that they – that the insurers needed to be the villain um, when in fact they would spent months working with the insurers uh, and in, the insurers were uh, the – probably the biggest beneficiary um, – Certainly, one of the biggest beneficiaries of the law. I mean, it's a it's a requirement that everyone in the United States, more or less, buy their product. No, what yeah. other company? What other? Excuse me. What other industry? Um, that would be great. Any industry should have that. Absolutely. <laughs> right. That's of course only going to work if the penalty for the mandate, or I guess it's we're supposed to call it a tax now, is what Justice Roberts. Decided it was. It's a tax. Right? It's not a tax. It's a penalty. It's but, whatever but if, you want it to be, and whatever it is at any given moment, it's also not that <laughs> because whatever it is causes some problem, and so whenever it's causing the problem, it's the other thing. But how much does the amount of that penalty? How does it compare to the cost of insurance? Because if the penalty is less bucks, than, yeah. than less than the cost of buying insurance, then I'll just happily pay the penalty until I need insurance, right? And so there's. Two parts to the response. One is that up is just that the cost of the penalty up front for the first couple of years it's really not a huge amount of money, um, but it rises over time and it's a percentage of income, and so it uh, it can eventually be relatively painful a couple percent uh, 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 because it's based on income rather than just a flat fee. Um, but the other thing is that there's uh, now. Something built into the law to try and mitigate that effect, which is the open enrollment periods, which is why you don't see people talking about sign up for Obamacare any time of the year um, because uh, with some exceptions, most people are um, – or can only get coverage through the exchanges during the open enrollment period, which this year started in November and uh, ends here in the middle of February. And um, and so what that does is it means that you can't just presume that the rest of the during the rest of the year you'll be able to get insurance at any time. There are qualifying life events that allow you to jump on the exchanges outside of the open enrollment period. Things like having a baby or losing your job, um, but uh, but for the most part, you you can't just call them up in June or August and, and say, "Give me insurance now." I'm on the way to the emergency room. And also, interestingly. Uh, on a legal side of this, which is part of the original first Obamacare decision, is that it seems like if you read the decision that if a, the penalty for not having the tax, the penalty, the Schrodinger's tax, whatever it is, if you if it goes too high, it will become unconstitutional. We don't know what that is, but it's if it becomes too much of a penalty and not enough of a tax, it could become unconstitutional. We don't know where that line is, but it's a possible case in the future. It's Schrodinger's tax. Exactly. Penalty. Unicorn tax, whatever you want to call Mandate. it. Mandate. So that you, to clarify too, you mentioned the exchanges. Um, what is that exactly supposed to be or what are they? <laughs> what is that? Those are two different be? questions. <laughs> uh, the exchange is supposed to be – Amazon.com of healthcare, right? Uh, <laughs> Priceline, hot, um, Hotwire, it, exactly. That's that's exactly what Obama said it was going to be uh, three days before they opened and didn't work at all. Um, no, seven days, I, the week before, roughly. Um, uh, the exchanges are, like I said, they're these sort of government built, government managed um, uh, depots for. Obamacare insurance. Um, mostly they're online. They do have call centers also so that if you're, if you're not able to get online, you can get insurance other ways. A few of them I believe have at least at certain points had retail stores. I don't know if those retail stores are persistent or just open for a few months a year or just during the first open enrollment period. Um, the exchanges are the you know, it's just, the, just there to facilitate the purchase of coverage uh, under the law, and each state was the. Um, they, they're they're run on a. They're not run by the states in every case, um, but they are run at the state level. So there's a different sort of. So there's an exchange for Florida, an exchange for Texas, an exchange for California. Um, uh, states were given the choice 
to set up an exchange or not set up an exchange um, with the understanding that the federal government would create what was called a fallback exchange um, f uh, in the states where that didn't happen. Um, most states chose not to set up an exchange. This was something that no one uh, uh, pro or con, no one expected. Go, if you go back and read the coverage from uh, early 2010, as the law was becoming, you know, was right was moving towards passage, uh, even right after passage, um, it was you know more or less universally expected that every state would uh, would end up establishing its own exchange, and in the end, um, 34 at least 34 didn't sort of depends on how you define because some of the states ended up doing these things where they're partnership exchanges but um, the majority of states ended up not uh, not setting up their own exchanges which was something of a of a surprise um, I think certainly to the administration which had just totally counted on the states doing all the work and the and the federal government not having to set up um, any uh, any of the exchanges, uh, you can see that in the law in that there was no money uh, set aside for establishing – for building a federal exchange. They they just – they forgot about it because why would you need money to build an exchange that is not going to be built? That was the assumption. Well, I think that's a good – this is a good time to go on to uh, this week, the first week of March. There is a case being argued in the Supreme Court, the King v. Burwell case, which directly comes from what you were just explaining. So I think it's probably a good time we can talk about – what that argument is. It is this argument it, um, is in some ways a, uh, a little bit complicated and a little bit technical and in other ways exceedingly simple and straightforward. And so um, if you look at the actual text of Obamacare, uh, the text of the legislation says that subsidies – under the law are limited – Subsidies to, to individual people. Right. So the, the subsidies that individuals get to purchase private health insurance uh, under the law, um, one, le one of the legs of the stool, those subsidies are limited to exchanges established by a state under Section 1311 of the law. It defines state, which capitalizes uh, – defines state um, as one of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. And Section 1311 is a section that deals only with state-run exchanges. There's a separate section, Section 1321, that deals with federal exchanges. So that language, which appears um, multiple times, is pretty clear. There's subsidies in state-established exchanges, which would seem to uh, strongly imply uh, that there are not subsidies in federal exchanges. Uh, in the federally run exchanges. Of course, the federal government is now running the majority of the exchanges because the states opted out. And so um, that uh, is interesting and complicated um, because the federal government decided that they were just going to give subsidies in those exchanges. Um, and the IRS wrote a rule uh, saying that we are – basically, we're going to treat this as if it says and federal exchanges too. And that's how they have treated it and that has been their implementation. And so the challengers in this case are going to argue to the Supreme Court that, uh, that the administration's implementation of Obamacare is, uh, is illegal under the statute and that the statute simply prohibits um, – or maybe I should say the statute does not allow for and therefore cannot be construed to allow for uh, the – the subsidies to flow through these uh, federal exchanges. Was this only giving subsidies on – to state-run exchanges intentional? I mean you mentioned there's a section in the law talking about federal exchanges and if the subsidies are part of the three-legged stool, then they're pretty central to Obamacare. So it seems weird that they would talk about setting up exchanges that don't have the subsidies. So is this an oversight on their part? Did they just kind of forget that paragraph from the section on the federal subsidies or did they mean to do it this way? Well, any language that appears twice in a law, anytime you see very specific phrasing like that, again, it's not just established by a state. It's established by a state under Section 1311, says it several times, defines state 
and points us to the one part of the law, the one – Section 1311 that deals with state exchanges, not this part of the law that deals with federal exchanges. In other places, when they want to talk about the federal exchanges, they point you to uh, Section 1321. And so – it seems very difficult to me to think that that was – I mean I don't know. Can you trip and just like <laughs> not – like, like uh, do, you, do you sleep right law? I mean someone some, wrote some that might. language. Someone wrote that language intentionally. It was not an accident. It was, it was repeated. It was um, – you know, this law went through a huge amount of, of, of revision um, and, and, and writing and it was kept in the final version. Um, and this is the version that they chose to pass. Uh, this is the version that the House voted for, that the Senate voted for, that Obama signed into law. Uh, did every single legislator signing the law know about that wording? Had they uh, – and, and, and understand it perfectly? Um, I, I think probably not. Um, but I think – most – many of the legislators, maybe most, didn't understand the bulk of the law um, or certainly not the bulk of the details and the all, – all of those specific complex implementation and administrative details uh, that we talked about earlier. Again, you go back to the Nancy Pelosi quote, we have to pass the law to find out what's in it. Um, you can uh, – there's you there's record of I believe um, Max Baucus basically – uh, saying I didn't read, you know, I didn't read the thing. Max Baucus is arguably the principal legislative author. His staff has claimed he wrote Obamacare, um, and he, he, I'm sure he re- he read many pages of it. I seriously doubt he read every single page of the legislative text. Um, and so, th- it it is um, it then creates problems uh, down the road when legislators vote on extremely lengthy, extremely complicated laws um, that they don't fully understand. And like I said, I don't think anyone fully understands every single detail and provision that is related to this law, including all the regulations. But there's also a reason on top of the clear – the clarity of the law – in referring to the section over and over again, there's a reason that they would withhold subsidies from states that didn't create exchanges, correct? Uh, yes. So this is a, um, a reasonably common way of doing things in Washington, which is that you can't force states to do stuff. The, you, the federal government can't just be like, we I can't demand either. states. Yes. Also, you cannot. I cannot, um, sadly. Uh, but the federal government is not allowed to simply order states around. And so the uh, – so it's reasonably common to give states incentives to do the things that the federal government wants and expects that it will do. And in most cases, what happens is it's set up where there's some sort of situation where um, the federal government wants and expects states to do something. It creates an incentive system and then states follow along sometimes bargaining for um, you know, small exceptions or carve-outs for their particular state. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, to some extent, Medicaid has uh, worked this way. There's a big federal uh, – there's a lot of federal bonus money. Um, they, do, they do a matching program. Um, so that uh, you know, states will – so that states will spend on Medicaid. Um, Medicaid uh, – the Medicaid expansion – excuse me, the original Medicaid program, not the Medicaid expansion included in Obamacare, but the original Medicaid program took uh, many years to roll out for every state to, to buy in um, because it, you can't make these things mandatory for states and so the federal government can instead entice states um, or uh, arguably penal, penalize them um, by not giving them – by not giving them these these sorts of uh, bonuses or enticements, um, and so you know, in that sense, um, it's fairly consistent with how the federal government has operated. Especially again, when you go back to the and and you know, realize that the universal assumption was that all of the states would. So if you assume that all of the states will, you build in an, an incentive, but you don't really deal in great detail. Um, 
you don't you know sort of work through in great detail. Well, what happens if they don't? The contingency plan, um, because you just expect that the contingency plan will never be put into effect. Most of the problems you've described regarding the law have been it's very big, very complicated. There's details we don't understand, or details that were written in to accomplish stuff that's not very helpful. But at at the basic level, this three prong this three legged stool approach to fixing American health care. What's wrong with that? Is Obamacare at the kind of conceptual level the right way to go about improving health care, or is it just wrong from the get-go regardless of all these other little details? It's partially that the scheme itself has problems, but the bigger thing that I would say is actually that um, the problem with American health care is American health is the American health care system. And what Obamacare did was it said, okay, we're going to take the American health care system as a given and then try and build some sort of framework out from and on top of that. And the problem with with the U.S. healthcare system is not Obamacare, and you get rid of Obamacare, and then we're, we're great. The problem with the U.S. healthcare system is the decades of uh, federal and state regulations and subsidies that have just completely uh, messed up the market. And so, everything from Medicare and Medicaid to the uh, employer carve out that we were talking about earlier, um, what what you have uh, is a multi-part, fragmented, layered system that's not cohesive, has uh, relies heavily on third-party payment, isn't responsive to prices, isn't responsive to patients, um, and doesn't innovate uh, or or manage itself in the way that any other, uh, you know, that any sort of reasonably effective. Part of the part of the market does, and so it's not responsive to the the usual sorts of incentives um, that that push industries to be more efficient, to be more effective, to be you know more cost effective, to be more responsive to customers, to patients. And but so, if, if so they, doing that is the I mean, but if we have to take the U.S. healthcare system as it exists as a given, like it's too entrenched, it's been going on for too long to just tear it down and start over with something much better, then is how is Obamacare a way to at least improve things a little bit on top of a bad system or is it – again, conceptually, not in all these little details, going to make that existing system worse? I think it makes it worse certainly in the sense that uh, it makes it harder to fix. And so what Obamacare did was it – entrenched that system further. And that system was always going to be extremely difficult to uh, to repair. And certainly, I mean, politically, it was essentially impossible to just chuck it and get a new one. Um, uh, but Obamacare makes the kinds of incremental, um, re- relatively significant reforms that might have worked in the, you know, that might have been possible from the old uh, coming out of the old system even harder, um, not necessarily impossible, but even harder, and I think that is uh, probably probably sort of the biggest overall issue I uh, I have with it in terms of the way um, in terms of the way it interacts with the existing system. Um, and so, if you want to say that Obamacare is uh, is a success, or if you want to say that it's an improvement. The way that you do that is you say that it gets people covered. And it – when we started, you asked sort of what was the intention. Uh, we talked about it was to get people covered and in that sense, um, it has. It hasn't necessarily covered people with great coverage. It hasn't necessarily covered them in a way that is sustainably affordable um, either for individuals or for uh, the federal government which pays for all the subsidies. Um, but People, more people are covered now, and so if that is if that is the sole way that you um, define success, then then it's at least an improvement. Um, the interesting story to me is that the American healthcare system has always been this. The one thing you couldn't have was quote unquote socialized medicine. Correct. I mean, it was 
always a problem. You couldn't have single payer socialized medicine. Ronald Reagan puts out things with Medicare and Medicaid saying this is almost socialism. And so we've had this idea that we have a free market in healthcare and are constantly playing with little levers in the market until we've actually created this very bizarre system where you get insurance for your job. If you're unemployed, you might be uninsured. You you have no idea what anything costs. You have no you don't even really shop for insurance that much because your job shops for it, and it's not doesn't look at all like a free market. But we still say we have a free market in healthcare, and now we're going to use these same mechanisms and now just put mandates on people, right? States, people, incentives, and, you, and it's like you're trying to create a garden, trying to be like, well, you need to do this, you need to get insurance, um, and you need to – these states need to expand Medicare and then you – employers need to – if you have more than 50 employees, you need to do this and sometimes free people don't do those things and then you have a problem with your carefully crafted garden of quote-unquote free market healthcare reforms. The thing about healthcare policy is that it, it's – there's so much planning. And then every time there's a plan, the plan doesn't work quite right. Maybe it works mostly. Often it doesn't work at all. But sometimes it works mostly. But even in those cases where it works more or less, it doesn't work perfectly. And so then the planners start planning for uh, for those exceptions and for sort of how well how do we how do we solve that little problem? And planning begets planning begets planning begets planning, and it's it it never ends. Um, and that's what we've seen in the U.S. healthcare system for decades. That's what we see uh, so much of in Obamacare. That's all Obamacare is. And in a lot of ways, Obamacare is is just a, a giant mess of stopgap measures of sort of whole you know plugging a bunch of holes in the existing system by uh, you know by adding on to what wasn't working. Um, or what wasn't working uh, perfectly, you know, um, uh, and so um, it's yeah, you know, there's there's certainly a myth that we that the United States had a free market healthcare system and then Obamacare came along, and that's nuts. Almost fifty percent of healthcare dollars prior to Obamacare were government dollars, and that's something that Obamacare. Um, Obamacare makes even more of the you know adds to the government spending adds and puts more people sort of within the government system of healthcare um, and within uh, the sort of system of government control of of healthcare delivery insurance uh, pricing payment and this is the other thing sort of this is my personal hobby horse here is uh, all of the payment controls that were part of the existing system we have this massive massive uh, system of, of of medical payments that go through Medicare in particular, and then exert a huge influence on the rest of the system, even the private insurance system, just because Medicare is such a big payer. And Obamacare didn't go. It, Obamacare, the legislation itself, didn't go full bore in expanding all of that, but they did set up a bunch of tests and pilot programs. Um, and now, uh, as part of a new initiative, sort of post Obamacare, uh, that some people wanted to include in Obamacare, they're, they're really pushing forward with a, a big slate of new payment reforms. And the history on these things, the, the evidence is at best mixed. It is at best mixed. It occasionally works under very good circumstances um, in, you know, in narrowly applied, right? But they, they keep trying to scale this stuff up. They keep trying to make it work at a national level and it keeps – not working as well as they hope. It's a kind of uh, you know cost control and uh, and health policy in general, but cost control in particular ends up being a kind of game of whack a mole. And you hit one head and you say, "Yay, we we got that guy!" And then there's another one that pops up ten seconds later, and it's you know it's just this endless cycle. The debate about Obamacare, both leading up to the law's passage and in the years afterwards, has been intensely partisan uh, and and the right portrays Obamacare as both catastrophically stupid and perhaps the greatest moral wrong done by government since the slave trade is kind of what you get from <laughs> listening like you know the talk radio and whatnot it's just it's this awful awful thing but you also hear sometimes that that Obamacare at least the the ideas in it 
were originated among conservatives or, or have roots among conservatives. Is that true? Yes. It is um, uh, the backstory to Obamacare and how the plan came together is kind of fascinating. Um, like I said, it's sort of in one sense, it's part of the long liberal effort to do universal uh, or near universal coverage. But in another sense, it's part of the rights um, effort to uh, to do whatever it is that Democrats are doing on health care but a little less of it. And uh, the idea for the individual mandate in particular was an idea that came from the Heritage Foundation um, in I believe 1989 in a, a policy brief uh, and it was proposed in large part as a response to um, democratic uh, – Democratic ideas about health insurance and health care, um, which at the time, there was a lot more democratic interest in uh, in single payer. And um, it actually – there were a number of Republicans uh, in 1993 during um, the Clinton health care saga that proposed a bill uh, with an individual mandate borrowing from this uh, – from Heritage's, Heritage's idea. Uh, and so it is in some sense an evolution of, of, of that plan, which eventually went on to inform Mitt Romney's health care reform in uh, Massachusetts. Again, Mitt Romney, uh, Republican governor, uh, he, he put in place the law that became the model for Obamacare in a lot of ways and the arguably the most influential advisor uh, for the Massachusetts plan, a guy named Jonathan Gruber, was also – um, an extremely influential advisor in developing the uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, the federal version of it, and uh, they said, you know, the administration basically said, we think we can get this done because we see it, that it's happening in Massachusetts. Um, it might provide some bipartisan cover. Uh, they they did not end end up getting that, obviously, but um, they thought it might provide some bipartisan cover. And uh, also that this was the kind of thing that uh, moderate Democrats who might be a little skittish about passing a big government health care plan uh, might be able to sign on to. Am I correct in remembering many years ago reading an article in your own Reason magazine proposing an individual mandate? I believe Ron Bailey, my colleague, uh, science correspondent, um, wrote an article – uh, in which he talked about some of the virtues. Uh, he's since uh, recanted some of that. He said, in particular, he didn't think about the constitutional issues. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was something that a lot of um, people uh, who are in a, in many ways um, interested in free market ideas uh, signed on to um, for a while and were interested in for a while. And uh, in fact, it was pitched originally by Heritage. Um, as a uh, as a way of in, uh, encouraging personal responsibility, um, individual responsibility, and avoiding uh, you know avoiding the free riding that becomes possible with other types of plans, um, and that was how Mitt Romney sold it. Was uh, look, it's not a libertarian idea exactly, but free riding isn't libertarian either, and we've got to do something about healthcare. So I'm going to pass a personal responsibility. Requirements as part of this, and 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 try and make it work that way. Um, and look, the individual mandate, given the rest of the law, if you start from the assumption that if you start from the rest of the law, if you start from certainly from the pre-existing conditions requirements, uh, you an individual mandate um, in many ways makes it work better. That doesn't mean that it works perfectly or particularly well, but there's a reason for it. It's not um, in the context. Uh, you know, once you've signed on to the rest of it, um, it's not entirely crazy. With this uh, new challenge, uh, the King v. Burwell case, uh, we should be hearing a decision sometime in June. Now, if the challengers win this, and if the tax credits cannot be extended to states that don't set up exchanges, then what happens? That is a great question. That I don't think anyone really knows the complete answer to. Obviously, if the Supreme Court rules that those tax credits are not legal in the federal exchanges, then at some point, they'll go away. And so that is – that's the thing that will happen. Uh, and then 
the question is, what is the administration's response um, and what is the response of Congress? And right now, Republicans in Congress are saying that they are uh, drawing up that they're drawing up response plans. I know that there are several um, Obamacare replacements in the works, uh, some of which are updates of Obamacare replacements that we've uh, you know, that we've seen before. Whether or not the Republican caucus uh, will actually rally around any of these is a big question. There's also been some discussion about perhaps passing. Uh, something that is that looks like a fix in exchange for something uh, where re- Republicans would basically say, "Okay, we'll agree to 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 fix this, to allow uh, subsidies within the federal exchange, but you're going to have to give us something." And it's not clear what that something would be. I actually, I think that that's um, that would be. Uh, I, I'm not sure that would be a good idea because it would be basically giving the administration a pass on illegal behavior and saying you implemented this illegally and we will now ratify your illegal um, your illegal implementation if that's what happened. I'm not sure that, uh, that there will be enough Republican interest in going that direction. But, but if we could, I mean if we – if this would give us an opportunity, this is a big if, this would give us an opportunity to – Start proposing something to actually fix healthcare, like something that free market people would believe in. What sort of things can we do? What what can free markets do to help fix healthcare? Free markets uh, can do an awful lot if they are given the opportunity. And um, this is a question that libertarians and sort of critics of government healthcare get a lot: is sort of what does the what does a true free market healthcare system look like? And you know, there are a couple. Answers to that, you know, sort of, we we can look at places where we've seen free market or sort of market friendly um, innovations. Things, everything from like walk-in clinics um, to concierge care. I think we'd see for sure we'd see clearer pricing and less third-party payment. Although probably not none, um, we'd see just sort of overall great and in, greater incentives for providers to serve patients. Um, and not just in terms of the actual sort of the actual medical eff- uh, effectiveness of the care, but in terms of making life easier for patients and figuring out ways to to do the business of healthcare in ways that are more efficient and more uh, more patient friendly. But the real answer is I don't know what a free market healthcare system would look like because we've never really seen one. And this is the sort of the terrifying thing about markets and also the wonderful thing is that you can't predict what they will do and how they will work and where they will go. Um, and really the history of modern medicine is so bound up with uh, with the history of medical regulation um, and of – of government subsidy of healthcare uh, all over the Western world. Sort of as modern medicine has grown up, you've seen these big government systems to control, allocate, subsidize, uh, and manage medicine as well. And so, no system, you know, modern medicine is is doesn't exist apart from that. And so, it's really hard to sort of figure out where it would go, given even um, you know a small amount of additional freedom. And I think that's really. Aside from from fighting off very bad policy and from stopping very bad policy from happening, I think what free market types in healthcare really should be looking to do is to create pockets of of, you know, of innovation um, and just sort of tiny spaces where the market can work outside of uh, of too much interference from the government. And you know, sort of, and just create. I mean, you almost want to think about you know, like free speech zones, right? Except it's free market healthcare zones, right? Like little places where, for just a few moments, and you know, in in one narrow, perhaps narrow way, we can see what the how how uh, you know, price posting works, how uh, certain types of doctor-owned walk-in clinics work, how um, you know, you can look at you can look at some of the experiments. Sort of that, you know, if you want to call them that, that have been run already with things like LASIK, which exists uh, essentially outside of the both the health insurance system, the private health insurance system, and the government healthcare system, um, and it's gotten better and cheaper over time, and right, just like you would expect a product uh, to do. 
And that's the sort of thing that we should be looking to preserve within, um, within the healthcare system. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.